Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar and for the launch of the second edition of the IWA WHO Water Safety Plan Manual. My name is Philip D'Souza and I'm an associate at Zutari, an engineering and advisory firm with offices throughout Africa and also in the Middle East. I'm also the co-chair of the IWA Water Safety Planning Specialist Group. Um, and many of you on the call today probably participated in our very successful water safety planning conference, which we held in Narvik, Norway last year. And hopefully you, you'll all be happy to know that uh, we have already started planning our next conference uh, for 2024. So please watch the space and please continue to interact with the water safety planning specialist group. We really value your inputs. Um, as you are aware, water safety planning is a comprehensive risk assessment and risk management approach that includes all steps in the water supply system from catchment all the way through to consumer. And water safety planning is a proactive management system that ensures continuous supply of safe drinking water by number one, knowing your system thoroughly, identifying where problems might occur, putting barriers and management systems in place to stop these problems before they happen, and making sure all parts of your water supply system work properly. The IWA and WHO released the Water Safety Plan Manual in 2009. And over the years, many of us on this call today have probably read, reread, and debated the content thereof. This second edition aims to incorporate the lessons learned from almost 15 years of development and implementation of water safety plans by water utilities from around the world. Before we get started, let's look at some housekeeping. This webinar will be recorded and made available on demand on the IWA website. Um, also, we note that if you have any questions during the various presentations, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel at the bottom of the screen. The speakers will try to answer them following their uh, various uh, panel discussion presentations, and we will then also have time for questions at the end. Please don't post any questions in the chat as this is reserved for other webinar related issues such as checking for sounds and connection. Okay, so over to the business of the day. Um, you'll see that we have uh, the various speakers um, on the next slide, please. Um, we have uh, four speakers today. Um, Daryl Jackson, who is a consultant from Australia. Margaret McCauley um, from Ghana Water Company Limited in Ghana, Asoka Jayaratna from Yarra Valley Water in Australia, and then Engineer Sonabal from the Department of Health in the Philippines. If we have a quick look at the agenda of the day, um, first we'll have some opening remarks uh, from Bruce Gordon from the WHO, um, and then Daryl will give us an overview of what we can expect from the second edition of the Water Safety Plan Manual. We'll then have a panel discussion where we'll ask uh, the various pan panelists uh, some interesting questions and learn from their experiences. And then we'll have some time for um, open uh, questions and answers uh, for the panelists to look at. Uh, we'll then have some final remarks uh, from Color from the IWA. Okay, so um, it's my privilege to now hand over uh, to Dr. Bruce Gordon, who um, is uh, the unit head um, of water, sanitation, hygiene, and health at the World Organization um, to uh, open the session. Bruce, over to you. Thanks so much, Philip. And, and thanks to all of you who have joined. I see there's nearly a 300 people that have joined and I'm really excited to, about this session. So just really on behalf of IWA and WHO, I wanted to kind of welcome everyone. Um, and as you were kind of saying, Philip, the the, the um, water safety plan approach is, is just so important. Um, preventive risk management is the central recommendation of WHO's guidelines. And, you know, the difficult part about it is is really not saying it sort of ought to be done, but, but how do we do it? And, and how do we do it, um, especially in resource limited contexts? How do we ensure equity? is kind of integrated into the approach um, and how do we kind of deal with some of the emerging um, climate risks? So as you said, Philip, I mean, there's been, I, I would say even more than 15 years of experience now from practitioners, from water suppliers, um, with inputs from regulators. We've had uh, countless trainings, including the one you mentioned um, and meetings 
so there's just been a real kind of um you know uh you know opportunity to hear back about what's worked um maybe what hasn't worked so well from the the first edition and so the the team that has put this together has has really kind of tried so hard to make this as user friendly and practical as possible bringing in all these these um you know these lessons and so that's my 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 main point here is it it does say WHO and IWA but I I see this as our collective resource we all own this it's a joint global effort and so that is why I am you know so pleased with it so um, I think without further ado I just maybe wanted to end on this point, um, and that is, you know, as the world kind of uh, is coming together in New York, uh, actually now it's this month um, to uh, for our, our biggest kind of um, engagement on trying to improve, you know, water supply and sanitation across the world. Uh, certainly WHO's commitment is to try to, you know, provide a, a great space for technical assistance on preventive risk management and water safety planning. And it's a pleasure to do this with, with IWA and all of you. So I think with that, um, I will uh, pass this uh, back to you, Philip, um, and uh, you know, with a lot of enthusiasm. Thanks very much, Bruce. Really appreciate your inputs um, and support uh, over the years. Uh, I think uh, water safety planning has made a huge impact on municipalities and utilities around the world, and it's thanks to the great initiatives of the IWA and WHO. So now on to the main event and a man who needs little introduction in water safety planning circles. Um, Daryl Jackson has been assisting WHO in its support of uh, water safety plans for many years mostly through capacity building and uh, water safety planning assessments. And if you have been fortunate enough, as I have, you, you have sat through a Daryl Jackson training session. Um, he's one of the authors of the second edition of the WSP manual. Um, and it has started way back in 2018 already uh, with these amendments. So um, uh, Daryl, uh, <laughs> everyone is eagerly awaiting your presentation and uh, you showing us uh, the new baby. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks very much, uh, Philip, and uh, good day to you all, and I hope you are all well. So uh, I'm really delighted to introduce to you the second edition of the manual. Firstly, uh, let's highlight some of the key drivers for revising the manual. Global experience. Since the publication of the first edition in 2009, we've seen strong global uptake of WSPs. And that's a trend expected to continue throughout the SDG era. A 2017 report found that over 90 countries were implementing WSPs or equivalent. So there was a good opportunity to learn from these practitioners about their experiences with the first edition and use these learnings to strengthen the guidance. The second edition also gives us an opportunity to address some common misunderstandings or misconceptions. For example, how the various types of monitoring fit within the WSP framework and some aspects of the risk assessment methodology. Thirdly, it became clear that water safety planning is broader than just water quality. The revised manual needed to better integrate aspects other than quality. For example, by providing more clarity on water quantity and acceptability issues, but still within the context of public health protection, which is, after all, the core purpose of water safety planning. Fourthly, the new manual needed to keep a pace with growing challenges and uncertainties faced by water suppliers, like impacts from population growth, urbanization and land use pressures, climate variability and change, and to ensure that resilient water supplies deliver equitable benefits to all users. And a critical lesson we learned is that greater attention is needed on the actual implementation of WSPs. And we're not just talking of developing a better document that sits on the shelf, but actually embedding water uh, safety planning in day-to-day -day operations, 
monitoring and management. And this is key to achieving and sustaining the benefits of WSPs at scale. And how to do this needed to be better reflected in the new manual. So how did we undertake the revision? So here's a high level summary of the revision and stakeholder engagement process. It began in 2017 with a global training event in Kenya, where a number of WSB experts shared their experiences with the first edition of the manual. This led to recommendations for revision of the manual, and this was informed by an extensive global stakeholder interview process. A first annotated outline was issued for peer review in 2018, and from this, a series of drafts were developed before a global peer review was completed in 2022. More than 30 respondents representing experts and practitioners from all six WHO regions, including water suppliers, operators and regulators were involved. So before I highlight some of the key changes to the second edition, which is I'm sure what you really all want to know, it's worth noting that the fundamental WSP approach has not changed. The experience of thousands of WSP practitioners has demonstrated the soundness of the WSP risk management approach. The first change to highlight is that the new manual makes it explicitly clear that water safety must holistically consider aspects relating to quality, acceptability and quantity, whilst framing these in the context of public health protection. This was covered to an extent in the first edition, but the new edition clarifies this and emphasises the importance of this holistic approach. Here's just one example of how we've done this. In module three, the first edition classified hazards as microbial, chemical, radiological, and physical. Whereas in the second edition, physical hazards have been reclassified as aspects relating to the user acceptability of the water. And we've introduced quantity related hazards to better reflect hazards that may arise from climate impacts, as well as those relating to equity issues for all users of the system. These changes in module three are then addressed throughout the subsequent modules, such as the risk assessment, improvement planning, operational monitoring, and so on. In terms of the second change, it's clear from practical experiences that while practitioners will develop a robust WSP plan, often there's a sense that the job is then done with limited attention to, given to actually implementing the plan. And as we all know, a plan does not manage risks. People actively implementing the plan is what is required for effective water safety planning. And this applies particularly for issues like monitoring, verifying and auditing as shown here. We convey the importance of this throughout the entire manual. One example of this is by presenting the WSP process as a continuous cycle, which can be visualized in four quadrants as shown in this WSP in action diagram. This includes the development stage, the operational stage, the verification stage, and finally, the review and update stage, which leads back to further WSP development and a continuous process of WSP strengthening. So this makes it clear that developing the plan itself is really just the first step. And the active implementation of the remaining stages is essential for effective and sustained outcomes. Showing an example here from module five for improvement planning, it's clear that in the development phase, the improvement plans are prepared. These must be actively implemented in the operation stage. And progress on the improvement plans should be regularly reviewed and the plans updated as needed in the WSP review and update stage. In addition, we provide more concrete and real world examples to support 
modules six to 10, particularly around operational monitoring and WSP verification. The strength and messaging on the concept of progressive improvement. And this helps practitioners better understand the importance of getting started and improving the WSP over time as resources and capacities allow. So in essence, not letting the perfect WSP be the enemy of a good WSP. Some examples are shown here, and this message is highlighted within the relevant modules. Thirdly, a need was identified to clarify certain aspects of the risk assessment methodology. To bring more clarity, module three now deals exclusively with the identification of hazards and hazardous events and introduces a template to help WSP teams better define their hazardous events to support subsequent risk assessment and prioritization. In addition, module four now deals exclusively with the risk assessment, where a one stage risk assessment is presented as the default example, but with supporting guidance on the benefits and limitations of this approach relative to a two-stage risk assessment. Further, the definitions in the risk matrix have been strengthened alongside additional examples to help WSP teams define the risk matrix in their own context. And the last key change to highlight now is the integration of climate and equity considerations within the guidance. Since the publication of the first edition, WHO has published supplementary guidance for these aspects, the Guide to Equitable Water Safety Planning and Climate Resilient WSPs on the right. It's important to convey that these elements are not bolt-on or optional, or that they are separate activities to core water safety planning. So the second edition has streamlined these considerations into the guidance to help ensure more resilient drinking water supplies for the full diversity of system users. The second edition doesn't replace these documents, but integrates their core messages in the main WSP approach. And there's clear signposting in the manual for more detailed information from both documents. So those are the key headlines from the revision process. And in terms of some additional points of interest, a strong emphasis has been placed on sharing real world challenges and practical solutions. Each module is supported by illustrative case studies spanning all six WHO regions and representing both lower and higher income settings. Now the manual itself is broken into four parts as shown here. These are self-explanatory, but I'll highlight a couple of points of interest. The toolbox materials are available to download in editable formats. They include some suggested templates for most modules. This is especially of interest to newcomers to water safety planning. And there are also supplementary toolboxes available via links. And these topics include a worked example, a system description checklist, list of possible threats, and a range of example risk matrices. Annex 1 highlights the key changes made to compared with the first manual. Annex 2 gives guidance on how to manage WSPs when you have multiple systems. And its three suggests how to use WSPs in conjunction with other management systems like ISO 9001, HACCP, and ISO 31000. And Annex 4 compares the single and the dual stage risk assessment approaches. Well, you may be wondering if you're now using water safety planning, should these changes affect your current WSP? Firstly, don't panic. It's not necessary to update your WSPs immediately. Consider the changes during your WSP reviews. And if changes are beneficial in your context, 
gradually integrate these changes in future iterations of the WSP. So that's it from me. Back to you, Philip. Thank you, Daryl. Um, yeah, and hopefully participants and practitioners are comforted by the fact that the second edition is not reinventing the wheel, but uh, rather refining it. And uh, also, I, I welcome the addition of some of these supplementary tools and templates, and I think they, are, they will be of great use to, um, to many uh, utilities and municipalities out there. Um, a reminder to please uh, continue to pose your questions in the Q&A. I notice we have had a couple of questions already, um, but yeah, we will have an opportunity for Q&A se uh, session at the end of the panel discussion. And that brings us on to the panel. Um, I would like to take this opportunity to briefly introduce our panelists. And just to note that our panel reflects practitioner experience, including that in, uh, from water utilities, and also regulators from diverse settings. So um, there's obviously a lot of, of other practitioners and experts out there. Um, we have tried to make sure that uh, we are covering as much of the bases as possible in the limited time that we have. So I'd like to start by introducing uh, Dr. Margaret McCauley. She's currently the Chief Manager of Water Quality Assurance for Ghana Water Company Limited. And prior to this, she served for five years as the Water Quality Manager in charge of the Ghana Water Central Laboratory with the Accra Team Area Production Region. She has been breaking ground for women scientists and engineers in Ghana since she began her professional career with Ghana Water in 1992 and has both on the ground operational experience and management experience regarding developing and implementing water safety plans. Our next panelist is Asoka Jayaratna, and he is the water quality specialist at uh, Yarra Valley Water in Melbourne, Australia. He's a chartered civil engineer with more than 40 years of experience in the water industry, and he has been with Yarra Valley Water since 1997. Ahsoka has been assisting WHO since about 2009 with several water safety planning initiatives, including authoring and reviewing uh, various publications with capacity building programs, including training and auditing in the Philippines, Vietnam, India, Malaysia, Thailand, Ghana, Indonesia, and Sri Lanka. Our third panelist is Engineer Sonobal, who currently works at the Department of Health in the Philippines. Her main tasks focus on policy making and technical assistance on programs and projects related to environmental health. Engineer Sonobal is part of the core team that has crafted the two vital water quality policies in the, in the Philippines, including the Philippine National Standards for Drinking Water of 2017 and the National Policy on Water Safety Plans for all drinking water service providers. She has an undergrad degree in civil engineering and environmental and sanitary sanitary engineering and she also has a master's in public health and a master's in municipal water and infrastructure engineering and then our fourth panelist is Daryl who we all know so for the panel discussions um, we have uh, going to pose questions to our panelists um, and then we will hear their response and please feel free to add in any further uh, questions that you would like the panelists to answer. So I'm going to start with Margaret. Um, and Margaret, uh, the question I'm going to ask you today is, in your experience, what have been the challenges with trying to move from the development of water safety plans to the implementation? And how can you describe any of the steps that you're currently putting into place to overcome some of these barriers to help your organization uh, go on a water company limited to progress towards effective implementation of water safety planning? Over to you, Margaret. All right. Thank you very much, Philip. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, engagement this morning. And uh, I'd like to answer the question by indicating that Ghana Water Company Limited has installations all over the country that is in Ghana, more than 95 different systems all over the country. And we have 15 regions. So if to, to, to answer the question of the challenges, the main challenge that we have had has to do with transfer of staff. Um, Ghana Water has not... Uh, started implementing across the other regions. So we started by a pilot in just one region, in one uh, system. And what happened, the main challenge, as I said, is the fact that as a company, we tend to transfer our staff from time to time. So the core team 
that worked on the water safety plan development in the system where we did the pilot, almost all of them have been transferred to other regions, including the team lead. So that has had a very big impact on the continuity because they have been replaced. That's the second challenge. They replaced staff. They do not have the knowledge, the experience, and the skills that the uh, team, the original team had. So these have been the main uh, two main challenges. And I would like to add a third. The third challenge is also the fact that water safety planning is not a key performance indicator for my utility. It has not been a key performance indicator for my utility. It's only since 2022, just last, last year, that our regulator has now made it a, a key performance indicator. And what the implication of that, the reason why that is a challenge is because if, you, if it is not a key performance indicator, it means that it doesn't even have a, a, a place with respect to reporting. So the chief managers or the regional uh, leadership in all our regions do not have to uh, report and on, on water safety plan implementation. So these are the three main uh, challenges that we have had. And with respect to the measures that we have taken, we have now completed uh, the um, regional sensitization. We've had to do the regional sensitization after it became a KPI. So we've traveled across the whole country. We have sensitized uh, more than uh, 600 staff and uh, stakeholders. And then also now it is a KPI, so that's a very, very important aspect. And it also is now a standard according to the Ghana Standard Authority. And uh, the next step which we are working on is to, we've selected some staff that are going to participate in uh, the modular trainings. And we are ensuring that in order not to have the same problem recurring, we are bringing staff from all over the 15 regions so that when staff are transferred, they go to the new region with the knowledge and the experience of the uh, water safety plan, uh, uh, the document development. And also, we now have a guidance document that has been developed. We were uh, assisted by consultants from Australia. Soka, uh, my colleague on the panel, was one of them. They, they have helped us to come up with a guidance document. And that also is going to play a very important role. What it means is that every staff will have this document as a guide. And, uh, and also the main objective of the, of the, um, of the training, the bonded training is to ensure that each regional team that will participate in the modular training will come out by the end of the training. We expect every team to have a draft at least of the, of the regional um, water safety plan for at least two of their systems. So these are some of the measures that we have put in place to ensure that we overcome the challenges that we had previously and to move forward with its implementation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Margaret, for sharing some of those insights, uh, some of the challenges that you have faced in the past and how you're trying to overcome them. And hopefully some of the other utilities and municipalities on the call can learn from that, um, including making sure that you are involving everyone as far as you can um, and you know making it part of people's day-to-day -day experiences uh, uh, and then you know, incentives like their performance indicators, management contracts and so forth. So thanks for sharing. Um, Ahsoka, I'm going to move over to you and the question I would like to pose to you is how has water safety planning supported your utility to effectively prepare for and respond to emergency situations? Um, including those related to weather events, as well as planning for longer term climate change. Ahsoka. Uh, thanks, Philip. Um, hi, everyone. It's great to see nearly 400 participants attending uh, this, uh, this event. That shows great interest. Um, Yarra Valley Water is, uh, is a world leader in uh, um, application of water safety plan approach. Uh, since way back in 1999. And this, uh, this meant this voluntary uh, approach helped us um, to implement water safety plans when they became mandatory in the state of Victoria in 2003. 
we call them risk management plans. Back then, we did have an emergency management framework. However, those that framework was not as com not comprehensive uh, in the coverage of safe and clean drinking water. That means water quality. Um, what changes happened since the implementation of the water safety plans? There were significant changes through the implementation of the water safety plans into our emergency management uh, framework. For example, every water treatment plant in Melbourne, so in Melbourne we have a wholesaler and retail, three retail water agencies, a uh, number of water treatment plants, and each of those treatment plants have site-specific emergency response plans. And um, at Yarra Valley Water, we have developed a emergency response plan, response plan for drinking water quality. We also have emergency response plans for other products or services, such as recycled water, even sewage systems, uh, sewage treatment plants, and they're all, pa all part of the framework. One thing to remember is, and um, very important to note is, these documents are not documents sitting in shelves. They, they are continuously reviewed, literally after every incident, and they are updated on regular updates. And so, if you look at our current emergency response plan for water quality, that incorporates all the learnings from past events. The framework is consistent across all water agencies, all water agencies in Victoria. Um, other stakeholders or agencies who, uh, who get involved in incidents, such as the police, uh, the Environmental Protection Authority, emergency services, and various other government departments. So we all talk the same language when we are uh, out of our comfort zone and in an incident and emergency situation. So how did this help us to manage um, situations related to, or events related to climate change? Unfortunately, we had quite a large number of events, um, climate related events in 2017, we had a very heavy um, rainfall event. Uh, that was something that we never experienced before. In in 2020 and 21, we had two storm events that uh, was very challenging uh, for the water supply system and also the other systems like storage systems. And we can't forget pandemic. Of course, um, you know we were we were reasonably prepared to, to face such uh, incidents. Um, as I said, emergency management, like the water safety plans, is not a static process. Um, incorporating all the learnings, we have appointed a dedicated emergency management coordinator just soon after those 2020 and 21 um, uh, storm-related events and that person coordinates all the emergency activities, working with various government departments within Yarra Valley Water, uh, with operational planning, logistics, et cetera. So it's very easy, one person coordinating the whole uh, emergency event. Um, climate change is, is always challenging, but also emerging contaminants is, is going to be challenging for all of us. So we have what we call a climate adaptation plan. Uh, again, it's part of the state uh, at a high level, the state um, climate adaptation plans, but we have our own climate adaptation plans, which includes the water quality. Um, so we will now include, you know, historically we've, we've always included current risk. Now with the climate change, we do have to include and uh, include the future risks related to climate change. Um, so, you know, the as from those examples I mentioned, the water safety plan really helped us and enable us, it will enable you to strengthen the existing emergency management frameworks. Finally, I would like to remind that 
success of WSP, um, whether it's emergency response plan or WSP as, as a whole, will always be dependent on how you're operationalizing what you do in the field. And that's what we uh, we practice every day and, and the learnings uh, are incorporated to into the plans continuously. It's never a static document. So I hope that helps and thanks, Philip. Thanks, Asoka, and uh, for also emphasizing the fact that these emergency plans should be living, you know, living documents and that everybody on the ground needs to know exactly how they work. All the practitioners need to know how they work so that in an emergency situation, everybody can, you know, jointly um, address uh, the emergency. Okay, we're going to move on to our uh, third panel member, um, Sonobel. And the question I'm going to ask you as a Department of Health official is, how can governments best support water suppliers with sustained and effective water safety planning? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Philip. So hello again from the Philippines to my co-panelists, Asoka and Margaret and Darren and to IWA team and WHO team and to all participants or to everyone in this webinar. Hello. So just a short background before I answer that question, uh, Philip. Okay, my organization, my organization, the Philippine Department of Health at national level where I belong has a mandate to formulate policy guidelines and standards pertaining to water safety plan. As of today, we have three national policies on water safety plan. First, we have the national policy on water safety plan for all drinking water service providers, where we set a national policy to require all of them, the drinking water service providers in the country, to develop and implement water safety plan. Second, we have the guidelines for the review and approval of the water safety plan of drinking water service providers. That set the guidelines for the review and approval of many, many WSPs that we have now. Specifically, the, uh, specifically on the creation of a review committee at different levels of the national, at the regional, at the local level. And the detailed procedures in the evaluation and the approval of WSP using a tool, review tool. Third, we have now the guidelines for monitoring and auditing of water safety plan of drinking water service providers. That set the guidelines for one, monitoring the progress of the WSP development of the drinking water service provider. Number two, the purpose of that guideline is to monitor the implementation of the approved WSP. And number three, of course, the auditing on the implementation of the approved WSP. Now on the question on how the government can best support water suppliers with sustained and effective uh, water safety planning, we, we are currently doing the following. First, uh, by issuing a certificate of water safety plan acceptance. So this is a very wonderful crafted uh, acceptance that you can display it in your uh, offices or in your uh, utility. So we provided this to the uh, drinking water sub service provider with and approve those only with approved water safety plans. This is also an indication that they comply to the policy on the Philippine National Standards of Drinking Water. The uh, latest edition that we have is the 2017 edition, where water safety plan is one of the very important provision or uh, uh, provision that you have to comply. For example, for the water districts that we have in the Philippines, around like 600 functional one or average of 600, their compliance to Philippine National Standard for drinking water is included as a KPI or key performance indicator in the evaluation whether the personnel at that uh, water utility or uh, at that water district may receive the performance-based bonus or the PBB. So other incentives and mechanisms for other water service providers are still to be developed. Second, we're planning to do audit of water supply providers with approved water safety plans every three years. This will be based on our guidelines for the monitoring and auditing of WSP. Third and lastly, we're currently activating all drinking water quality monitoring committees or 
abbreviation quite long like LDWQMC nationwide to strengthen the local drinking water quality surveillance or the local drink or the LDWQS. So we have this uh, administrative jo issuance jointly by the Department of Health and the Department of Interior and Local Government because at the Department of Health, we cannot do this alone. So we need uh, another department so that this policy will be uh, implemented down at the, at the local level. So we have the Department of Interior and Local Government. So we have this joint issuance. So in this joint issuance, we will ensure that all water, water service provider in the country will develop their water safety plan as required by our uh, issuance or administrative order on water safety plan. Now, it's good that in the Philippines, we will be tapping the existing, we call it Inter-Agency Committee on Environmental Health or ISA to push na nationwide the water quality monitoring, which will oblige all water service providers to test their water and ensure that the water uh, that the that their uh, water uh, meets the Philippine national standards for drinking water. I think that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sonobal. Um, and I think uh, also for sharing, uh, you know, some of those insights related to incentives and how we can make sure that, you know, there's healthy competition amongst utilities and, you know, uh, sharing of good practices amongst peers and so forth. So thanks for, for sharing that. And hopefully some other countries on the call can also learn from those experience. Um, we're going to ask Daryl, our fourth panelist, uh, to answer the last question that we have for the panel, which is, Daryl, can you share, you know, your reflections on the issues that the panel has raised so far and how the second edition of the Water Safety Planning Manual can help to address these practical challenges? I think some of these questions might also be coming through in the Q&A that I'm seeing so far. So thank you. Over to you, Daryl. Okay, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, a couple of issues that um, Sonabel and Margaret raised um, about um, KPIs. I think that's a really good example of something that is just touched on in the manual. Um, what I didn't say is that part two of the manual has, um, which is like a, an introduction and, and a quick guide to WSPs, has about three, two or three pages on examples of what makes a successful WSP. So we've listed about sort of 10 or 12 sort of headline issues with some little summary notes. And while that won't cover everything, a lot of the examples that they've said, it probably is picked up there. So that part two of the manual may have some good tips for people um, trying to, you know, face some of the real life challenges. Um, the issue that um, Ahsoka mentioned about um, uh, the WSPs and, and e uh, emergency response plans and so on, that, that, that the WSP is not replacing them, I think is really important. And um, one of the things we do in the manual is highlight that the WSP isn't meant to replace everything. It's there as a, an overriding umbrella as the way to approach things. And so we're not there to sort of start from scratch and write again. So if you have existing management systems like ERPs, you, you basically strengthen them and the WSP should be a good prompt to try and do that. I think that's all I can comment on now and we'll wait till some other questions and answers later. Thanks, Philip. Thanks, Daryl. Yeah, so, um... So far, I think we've got about 20 questions uh, that uh, we can look at. We are rapidly running out of time. And um, just to note that uh, if we don't manage to answer the questions um, within the session, uh, we, they will be answered and we will be posting to all those registered for the webinar. Um, so you will receive answers to all of your questions. Um, the moment that most people have been waiting for, and I, I saw that there were a couple of questions as to when can we actually get the, the, the second edition um, of the manual. Um, you can see here on the screen, uh, there is a website address. And also, if you have a mobile device, you could just uh, scan the, the QR co barcode, and that should take you uh, to the link where you can download uh, the second edition of the Water Safety Planning Manual. Um, 
with that, we are going to move over uh, to some of the questions um, that have uh, been posed. And we're going to probably have about five minutes of, of questions. Um, and uh, I'm going to um, perhaps just ask the first question, which um, is related to continuity of supply. So it's probably around, you know, intermittent supply versus continuity of supply. Um, is it given attention in the new manual? Um, because in my opinion, the question notes here, continuity will affect the quality of water delivered to uh, the consumer. Um, any of our panelists, do you want to answer that? Um, I'll, I'll have a quick answer to that. Um, yes, it is mentioned. Um, we have a one of the toolboxes is a suggested um, issues to think about when you're doing the system description. Um, uh, intermittent supplies is definitely one of the issues there. And in the uh, worked example, um, intermittent supplies are also there. So that's just a very short answer to, to that. Great. Uh, a question here from Daniel. Um, Daryl is correct that number one, the plan doesn't control the risk. And number two, that once the plan is written, uh, many conclude that the job is done. Um, how does this revision help to resolve that implementation problem in ways that the previous WSP manual did not? Or is it really still down to the regulators and the water suppliers? Um, I'll have another <laughs> go of that. Um, <laughs> Good question. Thanks, Daniel. Um, I guess at an overall level, what the manual tries to do is to is to give a lot more examples and illustrations of specific implementation activities. So um, it'd, be, it'd be pretty hard to pick up the manual now and not understand that, that going beyond the plan, beyond the system assessment is really part of a WSP. And we've done that by having particular sections within each module that talk about that. Um, and that diagram, which keeps popping up, which that WSP in action diagram, we hope reinforces that need. But as for whether it's really up to governments or the water suppliers, the answer is yes, it still is up to governments and water suppliers to, to make sure it's done. And what our contribution to that is to make sure it's really well understood with specific examples of what actions the implementation really looks like. That's my best attempt at that one. Great. Thank you, Daryl. Um, another question here on, uh, from Mark. Integrating climate change is straightforward, but please expand on equity considerations. Is this bringing in the concept of assurance of supply to all water users with different priorities, essentially all competing for the same finite water resource? Can you just expand a little bit on, on equity? Okay, well, there is um, a whole publication on equity, but essentially equity is saying, both if you're looking at an individual water supply system or whether you're looking at a whole collection of water supply systems, to make sure that safe water is delivered to everybody, not just some. And how you, um, you know, approach that will obviously vary according to your context. So um, this means that at all stages, well, I'm sorry, most stages or most modules of the WSP, there are particular questions to ask about equity for all the users and so on. So I, I think um, my suggestion is that you um, have a look at the WSP uh, equity guidelines for more guidance there. But in overview, um, it's something that should be integrated and mainstreamed in every aspect, whether it's a single WSP or multiple WSPs. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question here from Margaret from Elvis. Um, firstly, thanks, uh, Margaret, for, for your input. And he asks, um, to the best of his knowledge, uh, the Ghana Water Company Limited takes care of urban water supply and delivery in Ghana. And it, Margaret, are you aware of there are any plans to uh, implement water safety plans in the rural settings where most people are dependent on mechanical boreholes and limited uh, systems? Margaret? Margaret, are you there? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. 
Okay, thank you very much. Um, yes, it is true that Ghana Water Company Limited is responsible for um, the urban communities in Ghana. And uh, we have another company. In Ghana, we have just two utilities, one for the urban sector and the other one that is Community Water and Sanitation Agency. They are responsible for uh, rural water supply. And uh, interestingly, they are ahead of the urban utility. They have actually moved forward with the implementation of water safety plans. It is now one of the uh, indicators that the regional management and other staff sign to. So they are way ahead of us. They have implemented it in, in many of their systems. Over. Great, thank you. Um, perhaps, uh, Daryl, <laughs> more questions for you. Uh, perhaps you can help us. Um, firstly, we seem to have quite a few questions about will the water safety planning manual second edition be available in different languages? And then are there any plans for training packages around this uh, second edition? Do you have any insights there you can share? Yep. Um, as far as the languages go, um, yeah, the translation into into some other languages is a top priority for WHO and planning is already underway for that, initially focusing on French and Spanish um, with additional languages to follow soon. I don't have a timeline on that. Um, as for training packages, yes, there are some training packages being developed right now, which um, will we'll work around the second um, edition. First of all, it's being done as, a, as an introduction, but then the plan is to roll that out. And um, that'll be done probably through WHO, um, open WHO um, sort of web services. Great, and thank I'm you. And I'm sure WHO can provide more information on other plans they have there. Wonderful. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are running out of time. I know we have not addressed all of the questions uh, yet in the session, but as I've mentioned earlier, we will be answering all the questions and we will be sharing the answers um, with everyone that is registered uh, for the webinar. Um, we are going to move over to closing the session. Um, just a reminder of some upcoming IWA webinars. Uh, on the 8th of March, uh, we'll have a webinar on Empowering Women in Water, Perspectives from the African Region. Um, so please register for that event. And then um, also on the 5th of April, um, there will be a Young Water Professionals um, event that's happening and how you can actually create an IWA Young Water Professionals chapter um, within your country. Also a reminder that if you would like to join the IWA network, of water professionals, uh, there's a, a discount code that you can use um, for that. So in order to close the session, um, unfortunately, Kala, the executive director of uh, the IWA um, could not join us live, but he did take uh, the time and energy to put together a little video for us. So I'm going to ask William to play that, uh, that video for us now. Over to you, William, thanks. Thank you. And may I say what a pleasure it is to be part of this event. As we bring things to a close, I would first like to thank all of the panelists for their excellent thought-provoking discussions. Just as importantly, I would like to thank you all, the participants, for being part of the launch of the second edition of the Water Safety Plan Manual. The backdrop to why we are here today is that despite the many global efforts aimed at achieving SDG 6.1, the challenges arising from population growth, rapid urbanization, and changing weather patterns continue to hamper the provision of sustainable supplies of drinking water. As such, there is a growing pressure on utilities to effectively manage water resources to ensure access both in terms of quality and quantity in the face of these challenges. Today, water safety plans are considered the most effective tool for maintaining safe supply of public drinking water. Their use ensures water is safe for human consumption and meets regulatory water health standards. In 2004, water safety plans were included in the third edition of the WHO's guidelines for drinking water quality and the International Water Association's Bond Charter for Safe Drinking Water. 
Since then, a significant number of water suppliers have implemented water safety plans directly, and national governments are now promoting their implementation, including them in national legislation. Since 2001, IWA, with the support from WHO, have coordinated projects supporting the implementation of water safety plans in various countries across Africa. These include Burkina Faso, Uganda, Ghana, Guinea, and Tanzania, with Kenya, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Senegal being among other examples. These projects have not only improved water supply safety through the implementation of plans, they have also built a critical mass of expertise, tools, and case studies to catalyze large-scale water safety plan implementation across sub-Saharan Africa. It has been 14 years since the development of the first water safety plan manual, which was released in 2009. Today, we are happy to hear that over 93 countries worldwide have implemented water safety plans. We believe many lessons have been learned since the first manual was completed, and these are no doubt points on which clarification would be useful. So considering the changing times and advances in technologies, coupled with the evolving global challenges, an update of the manual was considered timely. The second edition reflects the many years of practical experience from the global application. Equity and climate considerations have been integrated to help ensure more resilient drinking water supply. More case studies have been included. In addition, the layout of this second edition has been simplified. We therefore believe this new edition will go a long way in supporting users both at the early stages of water safety plan development, as well as those who are already implementing them. As valuable as the manual is, and with water safety plans now being adopted worldwide, it is important that stakeholders fully understand each of the modules to ensure successful implementation. With this in mind, a global training package for this edition will be launched in the middle of the year that will help facilitate training. Also, we are planning to hold a more in-depth session to further discuss the manual at the upcoming IWA Water and Development Congress in Kigali, Rwanda in December 2023. Lastly, we are also considering transitioning, translating the manual, sorry, into French and Spanish later in the year and perhaps other additional languages after that. We encourage everyone to embrace this new manual. The launch of the second edition is an important landmark in the progress of water safety plans. I would like to finish by taking this opportunity to express gratitude to our partners from WHO for their support and also to the National Institute of Public Health Japan for their continued financial support. And lastly, a big thank you to all those who supported the review process. So finally, congratulations to everyone on this great achievement. I look forward to many, many more great success stories. Thank you, and I wish you all well.